The 49ers, just days after losing the Super Bowl, firing their defensive coordinator, Steve Wilkes, who was there just one season. In a conference call with reporters, Kyle Shanahan said he realized, quote, going a different direction was something I have to do. San Francisco will now be looking for its third defensive coordinator in as many seasons. That because D'Amico Ryans parlayed the job he did last year into a head coaching job, and he did magnificently well. But the reality is Wilkes had a better year this year than Ryans had had the previous year. Look at the numbers. I mean, everything on that right-hand column looks better. And in the Super Bowl, the 49ers only allowed one touchdown to Patrick Mahomes in regulation, and that came immediately after that crazy punt play that hit the guy in the foot. What I'm trying to say is, as we bring our football crew in, you see Tim Hasselbeck, Harry Douglas, and here's my man Damian Woody. Steve Wilkes is by no means, the defense is by no means the reason they lost the Super Bowl on Sunday. What do you think of this move? I was shocked, Grady. When, when, when I saw Shepter tweeted that, it like, like my jaw dropped because I saw the job that Steve Wilkes had done with his defense. We know that there's been like a lineage of defensive coordinators that's come through and has done a, a tremendous job mm -hmm. uh, with, with the San Francisco 49ers defense. And yes, he doesn't run the exact same scheme that Robert Sala and D'Amico Ryans run, but obviously with the numbers that you show, that he did better than what D'Amico Ryans did the prior, the prior two years. And when I look at when I look at it this whole year, especially in the Super Bowl, where were those five all pro offensive players on, on offense for the San Francisco 49ers? Mm -hmm. Okay, the genius, the genius play calling Kyle Shanahan. What, ha what happened to those guys? Again, just like you pointed out, this uh, San Francisco 49ers defense only gave up one touchdown, and that was after a muff punt, what we call, you know, like after a turnover. Yeah. So the fact that you're going to relieve the defensive coordinator of his duty, it just feels to me that Kyle Shanahan doesn't get it. Where is the where is the accountability on his part as far as why he keeps falling short in these big moments? Absolutely. Uh, Steve Wilkes is not the one who didn't use his timeouts at the end of the second quarter in the Super Bowl. Steve Wilkes is not the one who called eight runs on nine play calls at the beginning of the third quarter when he had a chance to take over the game. Steve Wilkes, to my knowledge, is not the one who said, hey, let's take the ball if we win the coin toss in overtime, even though every person walking the face of planet Earth knows that's a terrible decision. So one way or another, Steve Wilkes had a better day on Sunday than his boss did, and his boss fired him yesterday. What do you think of that, Harry Douglas? Uh, I think it's terrible. I was appalled. I was also disappointed. When you look at that Super Bowl game, it wasn't Steve Wilkes on the first drive offensively. Uh, it was Christian McCaffrey that fumbled that football. It wasn't Steve Wilkes that missed the extra point that would have put the Kansas City Chiefs probably in a different situation towards uh, regulation. That was Jake Moody. Also, it was not Steve Wilkes who was on offense after getting two turnovers and couldn't score one point off of those turnovers and actually had the ball coming out of halftime after the interception at the 44-yard line of the Kansas City Chiefs and couldn't get any points. So we're sitting up here watching Steve Wilkes get scapegoated again, and this is the third time, Greeny. That's why I'm kind of fired up about this. In Arizona, he was a head coach for one year. They let him go. In Carolina, after Matt Rule did a terrible job, it was Steve Wilkes that brought positivity to the Carolina Panthers. They they gave the ball to uh, the, the coaching job to Frank Wright only to fire him a year later. And now we see this in San Francisco just doesn't make sense to me. And if for Kyle Shanahan, if you felt like from a schematic standpoint that he wasn't the guy, wouldn't you review that before you hire him for the job? That's just my logic and my thinking. Yeah, if the defense he runs is not the defense that Robert Sala and D'Amico Ryans run, that shouldn't have come as a surprise. Uh, right. That's not something that you find out halfway through the season. You look up and say, wait a minute, this isn't the defensive scheme that we've been running all these years. That was fairly evident beforehand. Uh, Steve Wilkes has been around the league forever. Tim Hasselbeck, what do you make of all this? Yeah, I don't know what else can be said, to be honest with you. I agree with the guys on this one. And, um, look, I, I think that... You know, to Harry's point, the job that Steve Wilkes did in Carolina in some ways was remarkable. There are a lot of people that thought that they would maybe get the job. He would become the head coach there because of the job that he did. And so, look, this does not feel like a production thing whatsoever. We had the full screen up to start this segment. Like, it, the production was there. The defense was really good. And so, uh, you know, I think as you look at this, it's hard to make sense of it. Now, I don't know if it's a scapegoat thing, if it's a personality thing. But the reality is, like, for Steve Wilkes, uh, it's also a bad timing thing because, because he did a good job, because he's getting let go at this point, there aren't landing spots at this stage of the hiring process 
For a guy that was a defensive coordinator that just coordinated a pretty good defense in a Super Bowl. So, look, I think it's bad at every level, and, and I don't really know what else you can end up saying about it. I think that's exactly right. I hadn't thought of that part of it, but that actually is – the ultimate um, punctuation on the conversation. I mean, Steve Wilkes, where is he going to turn now? You're going right. to wind up. Someone will hire him, obviously, because he's an extremely well-known, well-respected coach around the league. He'll get a job. But certainly all of the ones that someone like him would want, one would think, have been taken by now. The, the whole thing just doesn't sit well, right? I, look, I mean, they can make whatever decisions they want with their coaching staff. I'm not here to tell them what they should and shouldn't or could and couldn't do. But this one just does not seem to pass the smell test. Yeah, it, it reeks to me. And I think Harry brought up, you know, his points about the, the, his previous stops, particularly with the Carolina Panthers, the yeah. job he did as an interim. A lot of people did think that he was going to get the head coach job only to not get it and then Frank Wright get it. And then he gets fired during the season the, the, the following year. Uh, again, the job that, that Steve Wilkes had done with the with the San Francisco 49ers this year was, was a really remarkable job. He doesn't run the same scheme as those prior two defensive coordinators, but nonetheless, he had a tremendous year. And to fire a defensive coordinator that was literally coaching in the Super Bowl, it just makes you scratch your head. And I, I just – yeah, I feel for the guy because, again, the hiring cycle is, is basically over and all the, all the defensive coordinator jobs are filled. Emmitt Smith is preaching that gospel. He was <laughs> preaching that gospel right there because I feel like so much of what, all, all those guys that play with that star is from what, it, from the, what Emmitt Smith and those guys did during that time mm -hmm. because there's so many benefits that come with playing with the star on your helmet. Are you willing to sacrifice and put in the work to really get the things that you want, that you really want? That's what Emmitt Smith, Michael Irvin, Troy Aikman, all those guys that played in that dynasty in the 90s, they put in the work. And now all these guys are reaping the benefits of what those guys did over two decades ago. The, Cow the Dallas Cowboys today hasn't done a doggone thing to deserve what they got going for them right now. Yeah, they got. We we talk about them all the time because they are the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah. They haven't won anything. They haven't been to a championship game. Literally, they are five and thirteen since the last time they won a Super Bowl back in 1995. I was graduating high school in 1995, <laughs> and these guys are still benefiting from what the triplets and all those guys did back then. They got some soul searching to do. That's why, like, we got a topic about Mike Zimmer. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Like, hiring Mike Zimmer is not going to move the needle because this thing is institutional when we talk about the Dallas Cowboys. And, and that is that was well worth the wait on my part. What do you think of that one, Harry Douglas? <laughs> Uh, well, we said Emmett Smith was preaching the gospel. Well, Big Woody was speaking in tongues. Shabala Honda. <laughs> speaking tongues, Woody. Speaking tongues, my man. <laughs> I love every bit of it because what the Dallas Cowboys seem to have forgotten is the main thing. That's how we start our show off every um, Monday through Friday, 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. on Freddie and Harry. The main thing is the main thing. And until the Dallas Cowboys start focusing in, focusing in and honing in on the main thing, we're going to continuously see everything that has happened to this football team since the last time they had a Super Bowl appearance. You know, Tim, it's fascinating to me because it's one thing for, you know, some dope like me to sit here and say, you know, the podcasts and the social media and all that kind of stuff, that should be the, um, those should be the, the benefits that you reap from your success. I, I have no issue with players taking advantage of all the opportunities that come with success. The problem is in Dallas, they have the ability to put the cart before the horse. The star comes before the star dumb, and that's what we're seeing. So Micah Parsons and C.D. Lamb and all these guys, great players, every one of them. But they're treated like they are legendary Super Bowl champions, even though they haven't actually accomplished anything. And that, I think, is part of the issue here, Tim. There's no question about it because, look, no one has an issue that Travis Kelsey has a successful podcast. Right. Because they're winning. Right, like, like that, like that's the difference. I think that's, you know, kind of what Emmett is saying. Look, you have success, like, or you're CD Lamb and you're wearing number eighty-eight. Like, you, you aren't Michael Irvin. Like, you're wearing his old number, but, but you're not him. And so, like, let's stop acting like it. I, I think that, look, winning cures a lot of things, and and they haven't won. And so, because of that, now all of a sudden we're talking about Instagram and podcasts with the Dallas Cowboys because they haven't done it. Like, has that been the distraction? I don't believe that it has, but I do think, 
like some of the comments that we heard, like from Demarcus Lawrence during Super Bowl week about, hey, their legs were tired at the end of the season. I think it at least raises some eyebrows about the mental toughness, whether you want to call that culture or not, but the mental toughness of this football team. And how does that get fixed? And does that start at the head coach? Does that start above the head coach? Because to Damian's point, like, I don't think it's necessarily just about the defensive coordinator because whether it's Dan Quinn or Mike Zimmer, that's not going to be the difference for this football team.